So, the usual announcement, first of all, anyone who's come to the introduction to meditation class, there is one today, isn't there? Okay, that is being held in the room to my right. Who's teaching it today? No one is. <laughs> it's happening, but no one's teaching it. Never mind. <laughs> But anyway, if you come to the introduction to meditation class, that is being held in the room to our right over there. This is the ongoing class uh, where we sit a bit longer and take the meditation a little bit deeper. It's one of the questions which I was often asked over in uh, Indonesia, from which I've just returned. They were asking about, well, if meditation is about mindfulness, then when, say, they use mindfulness training uh, to teach, like soldiers, how to shoot straight and how to be more accurate in their shots, is that really a good use of mindfulness? And often I've answered that, well, what we teach in Buddhism is not just mindfulness, you can even just say kindfulness. And that's what I've often said here, we practice kindfulness the combination of kindness and mindfulness. And if you have kindfulness, of course, you know, you can't sort of train uh, in any which way to shoot um, accurately and to kill people aggressively because the kindness won't allow that. So the kindfulness part of meditation is one thing which answers that question. We're not just doing mindfulness awareness just for the sake of being aware. There's also the ethical quality behind it, the kindness, the virtue, and also, the other thing is the renunciation. When, this is what Ajahn Chah would always teach, and he would always say, we meditate not to get things, but to renounce things, to let go of things, to see things vanish and disappear. And that puts a different angle on meditation. We don't go to try and gain this attainment or that attainment and get medals or certificates. There's many stories about certificates, we never do that here. One of the reasons is because when one person was, I can't resist this story, when one person in Sri Lanka went to, I think, a two-month retreat, and she did really, really well, and they had a group of lay people who would assess her at the end of the retreat, and they assessed her, and they thought she was a stream winner. That's a really sort of amazing attainment. And they all came up to her and said, you know, you're a, a stream winner now, and gave her the certificate of being a stream winner, and she was very upset and angry. I said, why are you getting angry for? You're a stream winner now, it's a great attainment. Look what the Buddha said about being a stream winner. And then she looked at them and said, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no. I came here a couple of years ago, and you gave me a non-return certificate. You've demoted me. <laughs> and you can't demote people. All those certificates being assessed by others, that is not sort of what we meditate for. We meditate to be free, to be free and to lessen our idea of you know, being a person, to lessen the sense of self, to lessen the sense of wanting to own things, to renounce, to have less and less and less, rather than a usual um, inclination in the world is always to attain more things. I don't know about you, but you know, all the time people want to give you things. A lot of those things I manage to give to somebody else, but when they do give me things, like for birthdays and stuff, what am I going to do with it? And so it's always a, a challenge for monks, once you get given things, how we can get rid of them. <laughs> it's not that we don't sort of uh, respect the generosity of the people who support us, but sometimes, I said this I think over in, uh, in Indonesia, I said, if you really, really, really want to give me a gift, then just do some really nice deep meditation. Get some very good qualities in your meditation. Experience some deep peace and bliss in your meditation. And then tell me. And that's one of the greatest gifts you can give a teacher. When they found out that the people they've been teaching are actually practicing and are experiencing some of these wonderful states of mind. And when that happens, they say, wow, yes. What a wonderful gift that is. That ma really makes me happy. So instead of material gifts, sort of as monks, you know, obviously we need material gifts to 
uh, pay the bills in a monastery to build monasteries, but the best gifts is the gifts of uh, seeing progress in this path of meditation. People are more still, more peaceful, more bright, and more sort of wise. It's the thing which happens in meditation. As you meditate more and more, you get more and st more still. And you, 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 I can obviously see that when you're still or whether you're agitated. And the stillness is very different than being uh, half asleep with sloth and torpor. The real stillness, you can see, it's got energy to it. You feel alive, you feel clear. And also you feel energy, brightness to it. That was some of the other things which people were asking me, that sometimes they meditate. Yeah, they can get kind of peaceful. And they can even sometimes see like nimittas, not the really the bright, beautiful ones. They say, what, what is happening? And of course, you can see straight away that they ask that question, they want those beautiful uh, lights in their mind, and they don't see them, why not? Because they want them. Every time you want something, it's like draining energy from your mind. It's like you've got a, a leak in the pipes. You've got something sucking the energy out of your, your batteries, which shouldn't really be doing it. And that means there's no oomph in your meditation. But when you can plug that leak, that leak of wanting, that leak of trying to get something, that leak of trying to aspire for something and own something more, you find that, that when that leak is plugged, naturally your energy just starts to improve. Yeah, there are times when you have physical tiredness, that's normal, you do things. That's why I'm surprised now Ajahn Bamali and Venerable uh, Sunya were here today, uh, this thing. They must be quite tired doing all that stuff which they've been doing. But nevertheless, what I would advise them, and I think they can know this, is like to just have a contemplate of what you've done so far today. You know, teaching all day, teaching some uh, great teachings of the Buddha. And that teaching, that is great merit. I don't just say that because I'm a traditional Buddhist. That is great giving to others. And I've always found that when you give to others, you get this huge boost of energy back yourself. Maybe not physical energy, but certainly the emotional, mental energy really boosts. And so that, you know, you have this store of goodness, kindness, brightness in the mind. You just need to focus on it and the mind wakes up. Not just wakes up, but it gets really beautiful energy to it. And that beautiful energy to the mind, when the mind gets still, it feels really happy. This is something which has been obvious to me ever since I started meditating. The brightness, the joy of the mind. The meditation is not something which is dull and boring, something you have to do, like you do studies at university, or you go to dentists, and no um, criticism of any dentists here. It's just something which is beautiful, you love doing. It's like going to the beach and watching a sunset. It's like taking an hour off and having a really good rest. It's like just going into a place. Actually, I did this once when I was uh, teaching like kids. At non not the Nolan I said, not here, but at the Magnolia Street place. And I had a group of children. And they were kids of the, uh, the senior Buddhists, and I taught them uh, and the meditation which was uh, using their powers of visualization. In this little house in Magnolia Street in North Perth, I sat them all down and said, now close your eyes. Now imagine, imagine just floating out of your body and up through the roof of this little house in North Perth and floating over uh, the suburbs, going to the west, and you can see the beach in the distance, and you float towards the beach, you float over the beach, over the sea, and you can see the coastline receding in the distance, and you see this beautiful island, it's your island, you're the only one who can, can land there. And you go to your little island in the middle of the, the ocean, and you land in the sand, really soft, very easy, very very safe. And when you land there, this is your place. And you can imagine it's nice and warm, it's not too hot, it's not cold. There's a breeze but not a wind. And you can see the beautiful ocean surrounding you. No ships, no people, it's just 
your private place where you can sit and just enjoy, no worries, no concern, nothing to do, no one to call you, no chores to be done. You sit there and it feels so comfortable in the warm sand. And you sit there in the warm sand and there's no pressure on your body at all. You can feel this warm wind coming past and it's even got a fragrance to it. And you sit there and it's incredibly comfortable. You have nothing to do, nowhere to go. It's your place, you can leave whenever you wish, but it's your place with safety and peace. <laughs> I only thought I'd mention that, but when I start doing it, I really get into it as well. Using the powers of imagination to feel that peace, that joy, that happiness of meditation. And then I say, well now it's time to come back. So, rise above the sand and come back over the ocean, over the, the beach, over the suburbs the North Perth, you can see the house and you go through the roof back into your body. And the kids love that. I loved it too. <laughs> it's a little way of doing meditation using the powers of imagination, which you have as well. So sometimes you can imagine as you're meditating, peace, stillness, joy, not just ordinary stillness, but beautiful stillness. You start to become like a, appreciate the beauty of stillness. You know, sometimes that people eat some sort of food, they can't really taste it. They have opened the palate, you know, the sense, senses in their mouth to taste gorgeous food. But then we're not opening the, the senses of the mouth, we're off opening the senses of our mind to be able to appreciate the beauty of peace, the incredible joy of silence. I don't know about you, but there's much work I have to do, much coming and going, much traveling, much talking, much answering questions, much signing books. And it's wonderful when you can just go back to your room after spending a, literally a couple of hours signing a book, same book, but couple of thousand different people. And after you finish signing the book, you go back, you can sit and meditate, and you feel, wow, I'm alone now, I'm at peace. And I enjoy that. I literally just even look for the enjoyment of solitude and peace and silence and rest. Because those are the, the places where a monk enjoys solitude. You don't need to go and watch a movie. You don't need to go out to a nightclub. You don't need to go anywhere, you go inside. And all the joy and happiness of meditation is there, just for the watching. And after a while, that, that type of happiness, which you can't grab, which you can't enclose, which you cannot own, it's like free happiness. That is the stuff which good meditators enjoy. It's peaceful, it's gorgeous. And because it's gorgeous, once you start to notice it, number one, you look forward to meditation. Number two, once you get close to that joy of meditation, it drags you in. It pulls you in. And the mind, as the Buddha said, leaps on to that joy of meditation. The bliss of stillness. One of the most beautiful things you can ever, uh, ever see, or ever feel, or ever know stillness when nothing is moving at all. It has a certain sense to it of, of really great joy. And the reason I say that this morning, this afternoon, is that too many people when meditation happens, they sometimes get a glimpse of that happiness and joy, but they don't actually go towards it. There's some fear in it. And one of those fears is people are told from the early times that meditation or any religion is not supposed to be happy. You're not supposed to enjoy yourself if you're a Buddhist monk. You're supposed to, you know, be austere. But you can see the Buddhist monks here and the nuns. We're not austere. We're simple living, but we have a lot of joy and happiness. And I'm trying to explain where that joy and happiness comes from. From the gorgeous meditations, and sometimes those meditations come extremely gorgeous. And that's one of the things I would love every one of you here to experience. And if you do, please come and tell me. And you can tell me that as a birthday gift. 
I say thank you. That's what I always wanted. To have more and more people enjoying the bliss and freedom of deep meditation. Okay, so let's give it a try. So, if you'd like to get yourself in a meditation position, if you're not already, I'm going to hydrate myself. It's the polite way of saying have a glass of water. Need any water? No? Okay. And once you've given that intro, now I know that if my body is going to be sore or aching, it's going to make it just more difficult to get into deep meditation. It's like another burden I have to, uh, or problem I have to solve. So I love at the beginning of the meditation doing a body scan. The body scan serves two purposes. One, it actually does relax the body and allows it to sit still for much longer. But number two, it's an introduction to strengthening the kindfulness. Because I know it's the awareness. The awareness is not good enough. If I'm just aware of my body and just don't do anything about it, or don't do the, the correct thing to my body, I'm aware of my body, I'm just aware of how much it might ache or how painful it is, or how uncomfortable. So instead I practice the kindfulness. When I'm kind to the body, which I just was because I wasn't properly balanced on top of the cushion, I could endure that, but I want to be kind. And the kindness is like caring for my body, not like I own it. It's like a good friend, my body and I, we do care for one another. So I can feel, I start feeling the feet. It's like a mindfulness exercise, first of all. I never thought you could be aware that much of feet. Until so Ajahn Chah used to tell us, tell me in particular, that I had stupid feet. He was correct, I was hardly aware of what was going on down there. And step on things, which I shouldn't step on. But now I can actually be more than just have wise feet. Have feet which I can feel any tightness and tension in them. And there was a bit of tension, my right toe was squashed. So I just moved slightly to relieve that tension. Shows that I do really care. And I now can become aware of my feet. The soles, the toes, the uppers, the skin. The more I become aware of my feet, the more that I can relax them. The kindness makes them feel good. And their quality of comfort goes up. I always find it fascinating, you can be so aware of feet. When I was young I wasn't much aware of them at all. And then Knowing my feet are comfortable and at ease, I go to my ankles. The ankles have a specific feeling. It's different from the knees or the elbows. Because we've been watching it for such a long time, you get to know it. Know the ankle feeling. Once I know it, then I can just like being kind to it, like smiling on it. I don't mean a physical smile, I mean a mental smile. Just notice 
what's before the words, you know, may you be well and happy. It was so much gratitude towards my ankles. I can feel them just opening up, relaxing, feeling more at ease. And when I can't go any further, I go up to the calves of my legs. I really actually feel them, get those physical experience of how my calves feel right now. They're pretty at ease, but nevertheless I can feel, I don't know what you call the feeling, the sensation. It's hard to find words, but I don't need to know words. You go directly to the feeling on the, the calves of my legs. Once I have that in my mind, is my focus, again the kindness relaxes everything. And anything which not, I can't really call it an ache, might be like a 10% ache in my left calf. I can now relax it so much. And it feels good. It's the start of the feeling of pleasure with a relaxed body. I'm not afraid of that. And I go to my knees, special knee feeling. I kind of imagine that too, like a sponge which is sometimes squashed. When you expand the sponge, you've got all these spaces between the sponginess and that's like my knee, it's just opening out, allowing channels of energy to flow in and out of those knees. It feels good. And mindfulness allows that feedback. And then I allow the attention to go further up the thighs. I don't have much trouble with my body like aches or pains or sprains. But now as I go up my thighs, just check everything, making sure they feel at ease. There's no tightness anywhere. I'm not pulling muscles apart, stretching them, loosening everything. When everything is loose, it seems to work much better. <coughs> when to the top of my thighs, I get my buttocks squashing against the cushion. I just tr attempt to make that feeling even so that all that pressure is not focused or concentrated on one part. It's spread evenly on both buttocks. When it's spread evenly, it always disappears after a few minutes because nothing is changing. It's a minimal amount of pressure. And then I go to my waist. And here is great. This is said I've been teaching meditation for years, for decades. I know this place. And the cushion is comfortable. It allows me to do what I prefer in my meditation posture, which is just stretch the back. And it relaxes them, the, the waist. The waist feels good. Actually, it feels more than good. It feels pleasurable. And I know that's a good posture. In other places, I have to to hold the microphone, so I cannot sort of be as comfortable as I am here. I make sure the back is okay. Feels good. So now I go to my torso, the bottom of the torso. I usually do a scan up my digestive tracts from the bottom up towards the stomach. 
and as I go, I can feel any tightness or tension in my digestive system. And if I do feel anything which is unusual, then I just pause there, give extra loving kindness. I find that's what relaxes everything. Fear, thinking, control, usually make things more tense. Until the lower part of my body feels, feels it has been relaxed, like it has been massaged, but not by hands, but massaged by my, my mind. I go to my stomach. It's only three or four hours since having lunch. So I can still feel the pressure of the lunch inside my tummy. But it's not sort of hurting. It's just like a weight there. So I give it some kindness, relax it. And it feels much better. Then I go up to my lungs further up the body. I'm not going to force the lungs to breathe this way or that way. I just be kind to them. I trust you, lungs. You can breathe however you wish. And I go further up my body to the heart region. Make sure everything feels okay there which it always does. There are muscles in your back and organs in the back too. If you feel, and mine are always quiet, but if you feel any tightness, pressure, ache, whatever there, just focus on it without fear. Give it that kindness of relaxation. And it usually just heals itself. Eventually I get to my my shoulders and I can always relax my shoulders some more. And I do that through an imagination. Imagination is all these strings. These are like the muscle tendons on either side of my spine, of my shoulder muscles. For some reason they're tight, they've been stretched. And I imagine those and just ask them just to relax, let go. Until those muscles aren't pulled apart anymore. They're loose, at ease. Not struggling to attain some position to impress somebody or not out of fear. Just everything is let go, loose, free. And I keep imagining that until it actually works. And I can feel the muscles relax. There they go. And my shoulder muscles feel so at ease. About as best as I can do. So I go down the arms. Pass the elbows but not too quickly, I can feel the sensation in the elbows, <coughs> elbow feeling, that's all I can call it. Maybe it's because I don't do that much work, physical work. They feel just nice and easy. Down the forearms, past the wrists and the hands. When I was in Indonesia, those hands were very, almost painful. I'm signing so many books so quickly. They feel good now. 
Ask the hands, are you, and fingers, are you happy there? It's not the normal position for my fingers in meditation, but they feel good. It's like I ask them, do you want to be moved? Today they say no. They're happy where they are. I trust mindfulness to tell me the truth. That's why when my fingers say they're happy as they are, I will leave them like that. And I go back up to my shoulders and my neck. When I get up to the neck, maybe I've been meditating for such a long time, I know that if my head is not properly balanced on top of the neck, it causes like an ache in the neck. So at this point I usually move my head to find its optimum position, the best position on top of the neck. When I do, I recognize that that's good. Now I mean that my neck muscles will be as ease, at ease as they possibly can be. And then lastly I go to my the muscles in the, the face. Around the eyes and the mouth, the nose. Because they are, they respond to your emotional world. You can feel them, whether they're tense, tight. And it's pretty easy to relax them. I notice the feelings in those muscles. If they're tight, I loosen them. The same as if you decide to lift up your hand. You can do that. You have the same ability to loosen muscles in your face. I've just done that. Now the muscles in my face feel so much more at ease. Doing some more. It's very powerful. And then, you could take longer if you wish, but I know now my body is pretty relaxed. I now know it, the whole body, by just being aware of the whole thing. If I find somewhere else I can relax some more, I will do that as soon as possible because I care about my body. And this is not whatever I expected, but when I relax the body that much, there is a pleasurable feeling of delight comes up. In my mindfulness, it's coming up now. It feels pleasurable to have a body which is no aches and pains anywhere which is relaxed to the max. Feels good. I'm aware of that pleasure, that joy. Even from the early parts of the meditation, I develop awareness of the joy of meditation. The simple bodily relaxation. And you get the inside, it takes you deeper into relaxation. And it gets to the point which is getting to now in my meditation. It's time to let go of the body. I become aware of the mind. Especially how peaceful am I? Like peace is one of the most important qualities of the mind in meditation. So I look at it. I'm aware of the peace in my mind. And if you're watching and aware of the peace, you soon learn the causes, the reasons why the peace gets deeper, more stable, richer in its quality. The main reason is because you're lessening wanting right now, you don't need anything it's as pleasant as it is. 
but the cause which people recognize more easily is you're in the present moment. Because all these things I've asked you to do only exist in this moment now. All the feelings in the body, you can only feel them now. You've been focusing in this moment for a while. And that's one of the biggest causes of peace. Right now there's nothing to do. All the doing needs perceptions of the future. All negativity needs perceptions of the past. When those two things are gone, in this moment, especially if it's pleasant, it's like you're free. You're at peace. You've got no business in the past or the future. I can feel that, I can feel that peace now. And that too now, is, it's got its own delight, different than bodily relaxation. Another type of happiness. And then just observing peace. <coughs> Soon go into silence. Peace becomes so precious, so beautiful, almost like sacred. You don't want to disturb it. Soon, you become aware of your breathing. Please stay in the moment. Stay silent. And just follow the progress of this automatic process. Don't do anything. If you find any joy somewhere, then please allow the mind to enjoy those feelings of pleasure in meditation. They are important. And I will be quiet now. When I start getting silent, it's really hard for me to talk. When I speak again, it will be close to the end of the meditation period.
getting close to the end of this meditation period. How do you feel? How much peace is in the mind? How joyful is that? Is it pleasant? Delightful? You notice the pleasure, the joy of the peace. The peace goes deeper. As you start to become more aware of your body, how does that feel? Sometimes the body is more relaxed than it was when it started. In a few moments, I will ring the gong. When the gong does finish in sounding for the third time, that's the signal to come out from the meditations. Please smile if you can. Okay. So at the end of the meditation class, you always open up the opportunity for questions and answers. And there are some questions from overseas. So we'll do those first. Gives a chance for your brains to start working again. Here we go. Question number one from Tim. We are not supposed to force ourselves to meditate or try hard to meditate. So say we are too restless, what methods can we use to help that? Usually you're restless because you're forcing yourself to meditate or try to hard to meditate. That's the very cause of being restless. So what I would do, if I saw any restless inside of me, I would say just why? It could be because there was some physical imbalance in my body, my posture wasn't comfortable. So I try and adjust the posture first of all. And then just caring for your body a little bit, the next thing I do will be care for my mind. I say, mind if you want to be restless, fine. The story, now of course I give answers by telling these stories from the real life experiences. The story which I love, which explains restlessness, is the mother with her child. And the child one day sort of threw a tantrum. Mummy, I don't love you anymore. It's only about six or seven years of old age. Mummy, I'm leaving home. Instead, of the child was restless. Instead of trying to force the child to stay at home, shouting at it, scolding it, punishing it, the mummy said, okay, if you want to leave home, I will help you pack. So I went to the child's bedroom and packed some important things of life, Spider-Man costume, favorite toy, in the suitcase. 
And the mother said to the child, before you go, darling, life is a long journey, so I'll make you some, some sandwiches or some lunch. And made the kid the kid's favorite lunch. Just showing like the kindness and the love towards the kid. And then took the kid to the front door and there the kid carrying the suitcase and a brown paper bag with a lunch in it. She gave him a hug and waved him off. Have a wonderful life, son. And a six-year-old walked down the garden path to the gate, opened the gates, turned left and then went off into its life. How long for do you reckon? <laughs> Maybe 50 meters and the kid was so homesick and turned around <laughs> and then went along the, the, the street to the, the, mother, the gate down the path. The mother hadn't moved. And just waiting for the child to come back. Welcome home, darling. And that was it. That's how he didn't use force or threats to get the kid to stay home. Just use kindness. So that's why if your mind wants to wander off, say, okay mind, if you wander off, wander off, have a great time, see you later. And you find if you're that kind to your mind, your mind doesn't want to go anywhere. It stays with you. So when I was much kinder to my mind, then the mind never wanted to go. The restlessness was because your mind and whatever you are um, watching, the object of meditation, has a bad relationship. You keep saying, no, Come and watch the breath. Watch it for half an hour. Do it this way, do it that way. Instead of being a friend to your, your mind. Anyway, the next question. From Germany. How do I gener generate more loving kindness in my meditation? I have the feeling that it is not enough. I would prefer it stronger so it is more touching. Great. You'll find sometimes the results of loving kindness. If I put loving kindness on any part of my body, sometimes you can feel it tingling, you feel it relaxing, you feel it, you know it's strong by uh, it, the effect it has on you. But loving kindness, one of the best, well, I'll just keep repeating myself because they're the best examples I've amassed over the years. The best example of loving kindness is to be able to say to your body, to a person, to a thing, to a situation, just the door of my heart is open to you. Real loving kindness to be strong has to be unconditional loving kindness. Not loving kindness, I'll be kind to you if you behave. If you do what I expect you to do, then I'll have loving kindness. No, it's just like giving loving kindness no matter what you do. Body, partner, boss, weather. And that type of loving kindness, when it's unconditional, that does start to have power. It kind of purifies it when there's no strings attached. It gives kindness no matter what. That's why that saying of opening the door of your heart, which was told to me by my own father, the most important part of that was no matter what you ever do in your life, son. It was the unconditional part of that which meant so much to me. And after a while, if you just experiment with that, you can actually start to feel loving kindness. You know it just by just how it affects your body and how it affects others. And how it makes it easy, as I said yesterday, how it makes it easy to open the boot of a car to get someone to become a bhikkhuni. <laughs> anyway, the next question, Gloria. Recently, when I am meditating and relaxed, I start to see scary image, like me and other people being killed. It is like a horror movie which causes discomfort and fear. How do I deal with that? If it really is like a horror movie, there should be no problem there. I remember even as a kid going to a cinema watching horror movies, but what I would do is just you look at the screen in those days, and maybe kind of helped that people were allowed to smoke in the cinemas when I used to go to them. 
because there was always like a smoky atmosphere in the cinema. So you could see this cone of light, you know, it was really big. The big part of the cone was on the screen. And you traced it back, you look back, and you can see the cone getting smaller and smaller. And so it was in this little room in the back of the cinema. And there you could see there was you know, the projector. And you realize it wasn't a monster. It wasn't really scary. All it really was was just you know, the play of the light, a delusion. And it was meant there to actually to try and make you scared and afraid. So, you know, you knew exactly what you're doing. So if ever you got too scared, I could always look back and realize there's only light playing around. It's the same with what you see in your mind. Maybe you've gone to too many Chinese movies that you get scared. These images of you and other people being killed, you're not killed, you're alive afterwards. So after a while, when you don't add to what you're seeing, you'll find that it just becomes like a, an image which has no reality in the sense it's not reflecting real killing or murder or anything. And after a while it will just vanish. But the other thing which I would do is just to know that those images you have in the mind, you're relaxed and you are starting to see images, you can actually adjust them. So what I would do is, I would start to see the funny side of it. That's my character, as you all know. And sometimes you start to mess it around. Yeah, that's something, you get killed, then you get up again. Hey, only playing, not really killed. In other words, you can actually take away the reality of what you're seeing. It's only an image, it's not real. And once you know that, you can play around, have a wonderful time. Again, so I've had some wonderful images like that in meditation when I was not that still. You know, just things like the monster which came up to me once. A really scary monster. With big bulging eyes. And just the hair was, this was a long time ago. And this was, you know, before the punks had really s spiky hair <laughs> and, <laughs> and it had fangs for teeth and what else did it have? Yeah, it had skulls around its neck and we're going ugh, ugh, <laughs> at me. <laughs> and I w honestly, I wasn't scared at all, even though it you know, could be potentially scary. But I knew it was like a creation of the mind so I could mess around with it. I put a straw hat on it, put Ray-Ban glasses over its bulging eyes, so you couldn't see that, it looked really cool, like, the, like an Elvis of monsterhood. <laughs> and <laughs> cigarette out of its mouth, blacked out a few teeth, like it needed to go to the monster dentist pretty quickly. And I put a scarf around its, uh, its neck so I couldn't see the, the skulls. Until it looked so, so actually stupid. But I couldn't help but laugh. It never came back to me. Or the other time, I was being attacked by a Hindu um, Rishi. So this Hindu Rishi was zapping me with uh, lasers. And so I was zapping him back, flying through the air, having this psychic fight. It was really interesting, really having fun. I knew it was only just a mental image. So I knew because it was my mental image, I knew I'd always win. <laughs> so I just had fun for five minutes. Told the monks about it afterwards. It was really good fun. So instead of having fear, antidote to fear is fun. You cannot have joy and be scared at the same time. Even years ago, I do remember just walking down here on a Friday night. We used to enter this by this room, this door. And I was walking down there, I looked through the window and this place was packed with people, Friday night. And I thought, oh my goodness, they've all come to see me give a talk. What if I really blow it and give a terrible talk? What if they never want to come back to the Buddhist Society of West Australia ever again? Oh my goodness, I'd be letting so many people down. 
There's like one couple of moments of fear. I thought, ah, oh, no, come on. I'm just going to have fun. I don't care if they don't like the talk. If they don't like the talk and I never get invited back to give a speech ever again, now that's cool. I can be a hermit and have a nice easy life. <laughs> so I relaxed to the max, honestly, and just enjoyed myself. And I noticed that when you have fun, you can't have fear. So I went up there and enjoyed myself, told a few old jokes, silly most of them, but nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless people kept on inviting me back. You must be all masochists. Well, no, you know I'm going to tell the same old joke again and again and again. <laughs> we keep coming back, so it's your fault. <laughs> so, it's a horror movie which causes discomfort and fear. No, it does not cause discomfort and fear. It's one thing which contributes to discomfort and fear, but there's other things which you can counterbalance that image, and you don't need to feel discomfort or fear at all. You know, I tell so many people, look, honestly, that if you are see a, some horror movie or something in a dream or something, write it down for goodness sake. Send it to DreamWorks in Hollywood. You can make a fortune. People love horror movies. They need a new script, and they got one, don't waste it. <laughs> so it means what you're doing is you're changing around the whole way you look at anything which other people feel is scary, and it never harms you. Okay, is there any questions for, from the floor? That's you guys, or I should really say, to be accurate, from the cushions or from the chairs. Any questions from the chairs? No. Okay, oh, yeah, great. Off you go. Uh, I have to wait for the <laughs> okay, so Arjun, you talked about uh, relaxing the body. Yeah. Sometimes that really, really works for me. And I mm. feel really like, uh, like really, really like cotton candy body is what I call it. Yeah. But sometimes, maybe I'm tired or a bit sick or I, I have slept in a wrong position. I feel like I apply the exact same mindset of kindness, but my body just doesn't relax. Or it relaxes maybe for a minute and then the pain comes back again. I have my ways to deal with it, but I'm interested in what you would advise. What I would advise is the wise people who are uh, getting up now and going and leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Don't wor worry what other people think of you. But there's a nice chair over there, which is empty. You go and sit in that. In other words, look after your body. Really be kind to it. Because if it's hurting and aching, it means you weren't really being kind to it. Look, I mean, you just, both of you, Ajahn Bhamal and you, have been sitting up here all day, basically just talking to people, teaching them about deep parts of the suttas. And of course, you know, your body's going to be a bit stiff. Yeah. So that's why I was surprised you actually came in here. If I was a, with you, I'd have actually gone and sat in the room there, where you could actually push your legs out. Yeah. You can actually, you know, even lay down meditation, however it's comfortable for you. Wow, got a few more now. Thank you. Yeah, somebody has to uh, melt the ice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This first doesn't matter. Either one. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. You did melt the ice a bit, so I have a kind of a related question. So. The first time I did a 10-day retreat, it was with um, these Goenka people. Yeah. And um, something that disturbed me was um, they, he said that when he was training, they put the monks in little cubicles and if, with a walkway between them, and if they were falling asleep, they could hit them with a stick to wake them up. 
and uh, that was a bit disturbing for me but what I wanted to say is they were very strict and you had to sit and listen to the breath and not move and I remember it was quite cold and my it was the last session and my nose was dripping but I, I didn't move and I did it and uh, so that ended and it wasn't very kind but I want to tell you that at the end of it I felt really good at the end of this 10 days and I wasn't very kind to myself and it somehow still worked so so that was a bit confusing and I, I don't like the Goenka so I came here yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And, but I still want to understand like it worked somehow like I felt like really good after the 10 days yes because it had ended <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I always used to say this. People would say, given these photographs after the end of the retreat, and everyone looked really happy. So, of course, they should have taken the photographs in the middle of the retreat. And it says that people could smile. But no, honestly, just, uh, you know, I've done stuff like that. I've never found it worked at all. It may work temporarily and just sometimes you just go through some pain but what is happening is you know, you're the one who does it it's your strength of ego it doesn't actually let go of a sense of self or ego there's no renunciation visible there to me and there's no kindness and that's to me is not just not Buddhism remember that a uh, Goenka type of meditation. It was actually taught by, not by monks. The stuff you're talking about there was taught by lay people. And even Goenka was a lay person. And I think many monks, you know, from the Burmese tradition would not agree with that either. I think that's going a bit too far. I often said, remember, the simile of bananas. If you want to know how to peel a banana, watch a monkey. They are experts on bananas. They always peel the bananas, you know, on the, the flower end, not the stalk end. Like too many humans, we peel the banana the other end, which is hard. And the experts on meditation are not the monkeys, the monks. This, we don't do stuff like that. And I can't help telling that story of, you know, just I was in a temple in Hong Kong and there was a, a gentleman, a monk rather, from mainland China. And he, we were just gossiping basically, how is it in mainland China? And he said, they went on this Vipassana retreat. And it was actually a Zen retreat, I think. But anyway, the guy came behind them with a stick. One lady was nodding, so she got hit with a stick. You know what she did? She got out her mobile phone and rang the police. And they came, they actually arrested that monk for assault. That was the end of the retreat. You can't. <laughs> I said, you can't be, you must be kidding me. He said, no, it happened. There's something wrong with that. You can see just how that could lead to so much abuse. So personally, I don't agree with that at all. Well, everyone has their choice. If you like that, you don't need to come here. But there's other monasteries I can <laughs> send you to if you want to get here. They're usually run by bikies or something, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, go on, next question. Well, thank you for the question. Hi, Jim Brown. Um, can you share more about kindfulness at different institutions because yeah. like recently there was a case where in um, one of the retreat there was an anger eating monster who was being mistreated and a lot of um, yeah 
unkindfulness was being treated towards the monster. Ah, oh, yeah. But a lot of, but the people who have mistreated the monster didn't know that the monster was going through a tough time. Mm. Yes, you know it's amazing when you do have people who are quite disturbing others on a retreat. I mentioned one yesterday about the fellow who was breathing loudly <laughs> during one of my retreats over in Sydney. And people said, please, can you tell him to breathe quietly? But as soon as I mentioned to people the reason he's causing so much noise when he's just breathing in the hall, he's got sinus cancer. He's got this big tumor in his sinus area. He can't breathe through his nose. He's breathing through his mouth. And as soon as I mentioned that, that was the last complaint. Now people do have kindness and compassion. If you tell people why they are they're making any noises or something, they soon find out and they, they, they're not angry anymore. They gave this guy so much kindness. And the nice part of that story is I said yesterday, at the end of the retreat, he had an experience, popping sound, breathed through his nose for you know, one minute, but that was all. And I saw him six months later, and he was in full remission. It actually worked for him. That's beautiful. If they didn't give him that kindness, if we'd thrown him out of the retreat for being too noisy, when he couldn't help it, he would have probably be dead now. And that's wonderful, this. Another case just over there on a Friday night, there was a, a lady just laid down during the meditation and started snoring. And then somebody just woke her up. And I told the person off afterwards. I'm not the person who was snoring, the person who woke him up. I said, that lady was going through quite serious domestic abuse, domestic violence. And she came in here, she felt safe in this room. And so she lay down and she just was so sleep deprived, she fell fast asleep. I was very happy that she could do that. You know, because where she had come from and how this was an opportunity for her to get some rest. When I said that to everybody, then people understood if anyone falls asleep, starts snoring, please let them. They need it for some reason. Kindness is so important. And I understand institutions, companies, corporations, even at retreats or even the monasteries, there are rules and there are man-made rules. And how do you apply kindfulness in all this trying to strike a balance between rules and, uh, and practicing kindfulness? Ajahn Brahmali. We have the core wat, that's the monastic rules at Bodhinyana Monastery. What is the first rule? <laughs> that correct, yeah. Always to be compassionate. That trumps every other rule. I, I, that was an Ajahn Brahm made rule. I made sure that was number one at the top. Everything else is under that. It was, it was man-made. All the other monks agreed, yeah, good idea, we put that in the top. That's important. It's like a, a monastery, it's following the teachings of the Buddha. You have to be kind. Thank you. Okay, next rule. Next rule. <laughs> next question, you had a question? So there's one question over here somewhere. Who had the question? No? Oh yeah, you're talking about the KFC? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so today we learnt all about the, instead of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, oh, yeah. the Buddhist stupa of liberation Okay. And we all agreed that the foundation to this stupa was Kalyana Mitta, that was the foundation to establishing good sila. So therefore, <laughs> <laughs> at five o'clock, we've got the Kalyana Friendship Community and it's the all ages group. There's actually two groups. I don't think people realise that second and fourth Saturday 
All ages, Kalyana Friendship Community, First and Third is Be Quiet Perth, that's a young person's group. And we have special um, guest today, Ajahn Pramali, is going to be joining us. You can do it. So a bit of a treat. Uh. And I've also cooked a pot of soup, which we will have after KFC. So don't <laughs> talk too long. <laughs> <laughs> that's really kind of you. That's really nice. Because please don't keep him for too long, because you know he was just teaching all day. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, now we can bow three times, and then finish off for today. And let Atubamani have a cup of tea or coffee or something. <coughs> Thank you. That's really quite surprising. It's like quite cute. Well done. Ooh. Uh, uh, oh, we don't do that. I'm usually on Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I, I started it. Arahang Sama Sambudo Bagawa Budang Bagawan Tak Abiwa Demi Suakato Bagawa Tadamo Damang Namasami Supatipano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangamami You don't have to do that. Sure. Yeah, I think I'm Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're going to have a couple.